Welcome to the IPM on the Fly podcast, brought to you from the University of Georgia Extension IPM program, with funding from the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. This podcast will focus on integrated pest management across a wide variety of topics. We'll invite guests to talk with us in the studio, connect from a distance, and we'll venture out into the field where the real action is happening. Thanks for tuning in. We're your hosts, Emily and Michelle. Today, we'll be talking with Becky Griffin, who is the Community and School Garden Coordinator with the University of Georgia Extension. And she's a pollinator health associate and also is the coordinator of the Great Georgia Pollinator Census. She's been involved in the project's conception, planning, implementation, and is helping guide the future vision. Welcome, Becky. Let's talk about this great Georgia pollinator census thing. Sure. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning. Thank you all so very much for having me. It is an honor to be one of your first guests on this adventure, so I'm excited. And of course, it's a day that I will get to talk about my passion project, the pollinator census. So the pollinator census is actually the great Georgia pollinator census, is a citizen science initiative that we began, this will be the third year for the whole state. We did two years of pilot projects before, but basically it's where our Georgians, anybody in Georgia can count pollinators on two days of the year. This year it's August 20th and 21st. So you actually just find a favorite pollinator plant. And that means something you see some insect activity on. You head outside, find that plant, maybe with a chair and some sweet tea in hand, and count pollinators for 15 minutes. And it's not as difficult as it sounds on the surface because you just have to put those pollinators into one of eight categories. So you don't have to be an entomologist. You don't have to be have studied bugs your whole life. It's something anybody in Georgia can do. So you said it's two days Mm -hmm. and you pick 15 minutes, one plant. Now, do you go to the same plant both days? Not necessarily. And you can do this multiple ways. Let's say we always pick a Friday and a Saturday. Let's say it's Friday and you know that the garden down the street is having a pollinator census event, like the State Botanical Gardens will have one. You can go hang out with those folks, have a little insect camaraderie, count with the group upload those counts to the website, and then the next day, count at your house. Or maybe Friday, you want to count with your neighborhood, and Saturday, just for fun, you have some people over, have the grandkids over and do some counting. So you can count more than once, and it does not have to be at the same location or on the same plan. Okay, and now you said there's a certain category mm-hmm. of pollinators that you're looking for. What kinds of pollinators would we be identifying? All right, so we did a two-year pilot project because with the census, we have several goals, but the big goal is to collect data that's useful for researchers to spot pollinator trends, population trends, you know, get, we want a usable data, but we also want a situation where people can count and feel comfortable counting. So to marry collecting good data and make it easy for every Georgian, there are eight categories. Are you ready for them? I'm ready. First one's carpenter bees, second is bumblebees, third is honeybees, and then small bees, uh, wasps, flies, butterflies, and then other insect categories. So anything else that you see on that plant that doesn't fit in those first seven goes in number eight. So with those categories, we're giving scientists and researchers data that's useful and we're giving people an opportunity to participate and have to learn a little bit of entomology. For example, carpenter bees and bumblebees. A carpenter bee, if you go out and look at them, they're flying around your house, your fences. Those females are out looking right now to build a home in your fence, unfortunately. But you'll notice that her abdomen is bald, and that has a very good biological function for her going in and out of her home. Well, she has a bald abdomen. We call that a shiny hiney. (laughs) Or you look at a bumblebee who has hair all over their entire body, including that abdomen, we say bumblebees have fuzzy rears. So now you have learned how to tell the difference between a carpenter bee and a bumblebee, and you will never forget it. 
So if I don't know the difference between the different types of bees or wasps, because sometimes they, they look pretty similar, does your website have a chart for me to look at or do I kind of have to just ballpark guess? No, um, that's a really good question. And this project, even though we're counting for two days, is a year-long initiative. And one of the main goals is educating citizens about the insects in their yard. So not only do we have a website that has a book called the Insect Counting and Identification Guide that will help you identify and put the insects into categories, but we have a very active social media education platform. If you go to Facebook and look for Georgia Pollinator Census, from the beginning of January through the census count days, we are doing educational snippets. Also, we have extension agents all over the state who do programming, getting people ready for the census and may even host census counts on those days. We also have project partners who are just as invested in this project as I am. And they also are doing activities and educational initiatives at their gardens. Callaway Gardens is a big partner. Uh, Georgia Tech, believe it or not, is a big partner. You can look on our website to see the list of partners. So you are not alone. If you want to learn to do something, you have resources all over the place to learn how to differentiate between those insects. And that brings up a good point. What is the web address for our listeners? It is ggapc.org. So G for great, G-A for Georgia, P pollinator C census, ggapc.org. For citizens doing this, and we're trying to identify, and there are flies and small bees, or is there a level of, we can feel some guilt-free data input, like we realize later that we messed up, maybe that was a small bee, not a fly, and we've put our data in, oh my gosh, we screwed her data up, and all people across the state maybe have put in wrong data. Well, that's a good Is question. that going to mess you up in the long run if a few people did not put their data in correctly? No, we know that is a possibility. And again, we're marrying getting good data with educating citizens. And I certainly wouldn't want anybody to feel intimidated. And believe it or not, I go through every line of data entered. And if something looks a little askew, like somebody typed in, we saw a thousand flies. Well, that didn't seem very logical to me. And so <laughs> I contact that person and say, can we clarify? So we're trying to get the best data possible, knowing that we want as many citizens to, to do this and feel part of this conservation effort and not feel intimidated that they can't do the project. Who all collects this information? One of the fun parts of this project to me is the unexpected. So when I first started this, I thought it would mostly be community and school gardeners because that's uh, my background and that's how I began the project. We do have citizen groups. We have gardens that do this. Actually, schools have become a big part of this. It is a no-cost STEM activity. So the first year we had 135 different schools participate and I can you know, definitely go into more detail on how to participate if you're a teacher. We have had businesses and I'm doing a lot of work with them this year. So let's say you're a brewery, like Slow Pour Brewery in Athens is one. They host a counting event. And that means that they have a small pollinator garden on their property. They ask their patrons to come and count and maybe they serve a special beer or mead or something, you know, they make a whole event about it. The Monastery of the Holy Spirit in Conyers, the monks count every year. The Daughters of the American Revolution have made it a priority project for this year, and, and so has the Georgia Farm Bureau. So truly, it is anybody in Georgia can take this and run with it. We have a lot of grandparents counting with grandkids. Last year, because of the pandemic, we did not have very many events. So we had a lot of people counting at home, building those pollinator gardens through the spring. So pretty much... Anyone you can think of, any segment of the population, they're counting insects. And you bring up a good point that you've been actually collecting data now. Right. We had two years of pilot projects in 2017 and 2018, and we had 50 gardens counting to work out the bugs. I had to say it that way. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so that data is not, we're not really doing anything with that. So the first state census was 2019. So we have two years of data collected so far and this August will be number three. So it's too early really to see trends and the data is just now being published. The first year will go into publication probably in the summer, which is very exciting because that means it's gone through very rigorous peer review, the methodology and data collection and the data. And it's very exciting for me because the data is starting to be used. We have a group that's using it for some crop valuation studies. So we not only have researchers who want this data, this week, I've been very excited to work with some schools and colleges who are using the data that they help collect for things like statistics studies, critical thinking skills, even simple addition and map skills. So that was an unexpected twist. I didn't realize, but the teachers were very excited because it connects the students with real world data and shows them how important and how anyone can be a scientist, you know, that type of thing. Oh, that's awesome. I, I love that thinking about farmers or researchers that do work in agriculture can start to collaborate with you on this. Right. There's a group in Tifton through the university that does a lot of the work with the farmers on economics, and that is way above my education level. So I'm happy to say, here's the data. You all do what you can do with it, and I'm glad to help provide it along with all the other Georgia citizens who were counters. So why August? I mean, that, up in the Piedmont, it's not so bad, but it's, it's pretty darn hot in August, but I can't imagine those folks in Tifton. Oh, they hate me. Uh, <laughs> I get, the calls I get, y'all, we could not put them on the air. Um, but there is a method to the madness, and I'm glad you asked because it gives me a chance to set the record clean, you know, set the record straight and come clean on this. We need a time of the year where insects and plants are growing and active all over the state. So I'm up in Blairsville. That doesn't happen till May up here. And we also need a time of the year where schools can participate without worrying about testing, school breaks, that type of thing. Well, in April, there's no way schools are interested in doing another project. They're interested in end of course testing, spring break, counting down the end of the year, field trips, that type of thing. So that eliminates the early spring. We had our pilot projects. One year was September, one year was October. That is tornado and hurricane season for South Georgia. <laughs> and we actually had a hurricane come through one of our weeks of counting and wiped out all the counts. There was rain for two weeks. So August, we have school in session, something's blooming. We have a time of year where everybody is available to count. And I just tell the folks in Tifton, get put some ice in that sweet tea, and I appreciate you so much for doing this for us. Also in August, we usually don't have all day rains because when it rains all day, nobody's flying. The insects are just not flying. We may have an afternoon thunderstorm, but typically in August, that time of the year, we do not have all day rains. Well, that makes perfect sense to me. So I feel like this needs to be mentioned. When we talk about pollinators, we often hear it lumped in as pollinators and beneficials. So can you talk about what is the difference there and are we counting just pollinators or, or, and why would we be not counting beneficials? All right, good question. With the census count, you're counting any insect that lands on that plant. So the categories are, as we mentioned, some of them are excellent pollinators like bumblebees and honeybees. Some of them, not so much. A wasp is not a great pollinator. A wasp is more another type of beneficial insect. Yes, pollen does move around when a wasp moves from flower to flower, but those wasps are primarily predators. And when you plant beautiful flowers and create a pollinator garden next to, let's say, cabbage, then those cabbage worms that we all have a hard time getting rid of are going to be scooped up by those predator wasps that are attracted to the flowers in the pollinator garden. So whereas most people are like, oh, wasps, we'll avoid them, I don't want them in my garden, by including them in the pollinator census, we're number one, teaching people not to be scared of them. And I tell people, and this is a true story, I grow plants to attract wasps to study them. The only Ooh. time I have ever 
been stung by a wasp, and this is the truth, is when I've been in my house barefoot and one had died in the field. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a true story. So the wasp is a beneficial. We are including it in the census so people will learn to appreciate them and draw it it in to help the rest of the garden. So pollinators are a subcategory of those beneficials, but we're actually looking at more than just those with the census. So I'm taking it a spider would be one of the other insects category. Well, my friend, Dr. Jason Schmidt, who is a spider enthusiast, will tell me that spiders tr aren't true insects, but we're not going to split hairs about that. And if you <laughs> see a spider, you just stick it in that other insect category and call it good. I'm sure you get all kinds of anecdotes. Mm -hmm. What about bee stings? None. Really? Um, only, yes. And I worried about that, y'all, because, you know, I, I want people to love these insects, but the only sting that I have had reported to me at least is when a child saw a caterpillar and it turned out to be a tussock caterpillar which you know it stings and grabbed it so it wasn't mm -hmm. even a bee sting but you know when the flat when the sun is out and the flowers have nectar and the insects are buzzing they are not interested in people you're in their way they're interested in what is on that flower what kind of pollen can I get I need to get food back to my nest you may get bumped because you're in the way but I've not had, had any, and please, let's, we're not jinxing it, I hope, for 2021. I was going to say, you posted an interesting article on your Facebook page I read about Angelita Jolie and uh, the, um, National Geographic World Bee Day, where mm -hmm. she had photos made where she was covered in bees, I guess, to bring attention to this. It was really interesting because she didn't bathe for three days so that she wouldn't get stung. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking... Is that something that's real? Like, should we not bathe for three days before we go out and do this so that we wouldn't get stung? Well, we you all know? know that Angelina Jolie seems to take things <laughs> to extremes. But I do tell people, if somebody's going to visit me, because I'm the um, beekeeper for the Georgia Mountain Research and Education Center, if somebody's coming to visit me and they're going to get in the bees with me, I do say, lay off the perfume, lay off the hairspray. Mm -hmm. um, no scents, no lotions. Yeah try to just be kind of neutral. And it's not that that makes them aggressive, but they may think that you are a flower, you know? And if you, mm -hmm. and if that happens to me, I know that if a bee lands on me and I've got, you know, something good smelling on, I'll just be calm about it. But someone who's not used to bees, they're freaking out. Oh my God, there's a bee on me. And then of course that freaks the bee out. And then we have a situation we wanted to avoid and start with. Matt, I'm looking at this post and this picture of Angelina Jolie with bees all over her. And it just reminded me that she was at one point an ambassador, right? This United Nations. An ambassador. Yeah. So now is it fair to say that Angelina Jolie is a bee ambassador? Yeah, there's a couple movie stars. Um, I think Morgan Freeman, I believe, didn't he buy a bunch of land and just let it go into native pollinator prairie? Oh. I read it somewhere. So I think it's, um, you know, there are those of us who've been, been passionate about this and concerned about this for 30, 40 years, and it's now becoming a popular thing, which is good, which yeah. is very good. One anecdote, I will tell you my favorite part, you know, from here on out, it is census 24 hours. I'm working with schools. I'm working with gardens. We're coming up with ideas. We're getting resources out. The day of the census, I'm a nervous wreck. Uh, is tech going to work? You know, we have thousands and thousands of people. I get ID questions. But afterwards, the number one comment I get back is this. I had no idea. These people had no idea of the diversity of insects in their garden. Huh. Just because we're making them sit still for 15 minutes yeah. and think about nothing else but what is on their flowers. And to me, that's the win. You know, we can get all the data we want. We can do all the educational initiatives. I can run around the street like, like a crazy person. Yeah. But when people come back and say, okay, now what? Now I want to learn more. Now I want to protect them. Now I want to know how they work for me in my garden. All because I made them sit down for 15 minutes. That is so cool. This last year I noticed when I was working from home during the pandemic, I set up my computer near the window. We had a garden outside the window and I would stop and just look 
you know, whereas usually I'm in my office in a building with no windows and during the day, don't even know if it's raining outside. But during the pandemic, I found that there is so much going on in my garden during the day, during the working hours. It was really cool to actually slow down, stop, and just look out the window and, and see these birds and insects. It's a little mental health break is what my daughter calls it. <laughs> uh, that's really cool. So wh why do all of this? What's this effort for? That is a great question. I was actually asked that yesterday. And for one thing, it's not just a, oh, bugs are cool. Insects are interesting. Let's look at them and count them up. Georgia is an agricultural state. And we have to have pollinators to, to have watermelon. Uh, we're a big watermelon state. Watermelon has to have a pollinator. All of our crops need pollinators. If we don't have pollinators, we're hand pollinating a lot of things, which I have had to do in the past, or we're eating a lot of wind pollinated things like corn and wheat. So it is an, not just a conservation project. It is also an economic project. And if you are a small farmer or even a home gardener and you want to get the, the best harvest that you can, you want more pollinators. If you have a pollinator garden and you've been uh, deliberate about creating it in a certain sustainable way, you also have other beneficial insects that are helping taking care of some of those pest problems like pickle worms and cabbage worms and aphids and things like that. So it is a feel good project that is purposeful in getting data to entomologists and researchers, but it also is a very practical economic project as well for our state. Why has this been your passion project? Well, um, when I was a little girl, I grew up in a really small town called Powder Springs, Georgia. So I'll give a shout out to McEachern High School, my alma mater. <laughs> At the time it was all farmland and there was one library and I went to the library and checked out a book on bees. It was the only book on bees in the library. It was very old, but it talked about honeybees specifically, about their superorganism in the hive. I checked that book out probably 12 times. And actually, I'd love to have it to see my name written on the <laughs> checkout. Letter. And I've been Aww. hooked ever since. And I um, worked on a four acre farm for seven years. And I was noticing as the subdivisions crept up around that farm and I could smell the seven spray. I was having more and more problems getting squash pollinated, things like that. I had to hand pollinate squash. So that was another piece of the puzzle. Then when I, I became a beekeeper, fell in love with bees that way, and then I became an advocate for native bees, which are very important pollinators as well. Um, I got my master's in the entomology department and just one, one puzzle piece fit another. And I was visiting community and school gardens across the state and meeting gardeners who were fantastic at plant selection and soil health, but they lacked a knowledge base for insects. So all of those came together and I thought this could be a project that could do a lot of things, meet a lot of needs, be super fun to do and make a difference in Georgia. So that's really how it all came about. A lot of little stepping stones. You said you could smell seven? Yes. Mm -hmm. It has a very distinct kind of acidic mm -hmm. smell. And I would, um, this was a farm that they had sold off a land around it and subdivisions were built around it. And I could open the car door and where homeowners had put seven for Japanese beetles or whatever, I could smell it. And I knew that that was going to mean trouble because seven being a broad based insecticide kills everything, mm -hmm. including the pollinators. So we ended up, I was hand pollinating squash for a while. And then I contacted a local beekeeper who came over and put some hives in the garden for a couple of years. But that was a real eye opener, how fragile that ecosystem, that relationship is and how dependent we are on something that most people don't even see. So all of that kind of, kind of builds into these type of projects. What, what is the big takeaway you think? My big selfish takeaway is to mark your calendars for August 20th and 21st and make a plan to count pollinators, whether it is looking on the website to see if we have some events near you, hooking up with your local extension office to see what they have, or finding a beautiful pollinator plant in your garden to count. All right, folks, 
We've reached the end of our program today with Becky Griffin. We hope you can make some time, 15 minutes to be exact, this Friday and Saturday to help contribute to this important work. So go ahead and choose a plant if you haven't already, and be sure to have your iced tea and lawn chair ready. And once you've tallied up your pollinators, head over to the Great Georgia Pollinator Census website to upload your counts. Thanks for tuning in to the very first IPM on the Fly podcast. We're looking forward to talking with you again soon.